calling it to order at 6.30 promptly. As is apparent, our chair, Stephanie O'Keefe, is not with us this evening because her father, John Cool, was in a very serious bike accident on Saturday and is hospitalized at Bay State. So I'd like to start this meeting with a moment of silence for John Cool with our very best wishes for his speedy recovery. Thank you. Uh, there appears to be no one here for public comment, so I'm wondering, uh, we should probably go to our first untimed item, which you could explain to us, if you would, about how the layout of Olympia Drive as a public way is going to work. Sure, what I'd like to do actually, uh, Dave Zomack, uh, uh, will be joining us any minute now. Okay. So I thought in the interests of time, uh, I could uh, briefly summarize the warrant, town meeting warrant that's ready for your signature this evening. That would be fine because okay. that will come after our first quarter budget update and those folks aren't here yet either. Okay. Um, so we have our fall town meeting scheduled to begin November 19th. Uh, we've been working at the staff level uh, and with our warrant review group, which includes the moderator and uh, finance, select board chairs, planning reps, myself and, and uh, TMCC, et cetera. Um, it is now ready for signature uh, and you have that uh, in your packets. Um, there are 19 articles uh, scheduled for the fall town meeting on a variety of subjects, uh, uh, including a couple of uh, uh, financial uh, articles, uh, uh, one capital article, uh, one related to solar. Uh, there's an article related to Olympia uh, Drive uh, street acceptance. Uh, we have a, a three recommendations from our Community Preservation Act Committee. Uh, for uh, recommendations for use of CPA funds related to open space as well as historic preservation. Uh, then we have uh, an article uh, that you'll hear about tonight related to uh, uh, banning polystyrene uh, in uh, containers. Uh, there are uh, one, two, three, there are six zoning related articles that the planning board intends to bring uh, forward. Uh, and there are four, <coughs> excuse me, four citizen petition articles related to, related to zoning or town bylaws um, that are uh, on, the, on the warrant also, uh, at the back of the warrant. So okay. it's been reviewed you know, by the group and by town council as the form, and we think it's ready for signature. Great. Uh, well, we still um, have a few minutes before our 645 item. So at this point, I guess we could do the new taxi driver chauffeur licenses. And I wonder who would like to read the motion? Ooh. Can I ask a quick question while we're finding those in sure. our materials? We have on our desk tonight, Mr. Town Manager, a town warrant that doesn't yes. any longer say draft on it. Is this the one we're going to actually be signing? Yes. Um, it's a copy of that. It been? Okay. And it's right. basically the same. But it's the, the most current. Yes. Okay. Excellent. And I suppose we could sign that. Just wanted to know which one to recycle. Okay. <laughs> right. Um, all right, who would like to read the motions for the taxi driver license? I would be thrilled to. Okay. Oh, that would be good. That would be this. lovely. To approve a new taxi slash chauffeur license for Christianer, Christopher Babineau of Springfield, Massachusetts on behalf of Celebrity Cab. Second. Okay, all in favor? <laughs> Aye. 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 Wow, that sounds really quiet. Three, two, zero, <laughs> and the two absent. 
Okay, and the second one? Is to approve a new taxi slash chauffeur license for Timothy Bowman of Amherst on behalf of Zeque Taxi. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Okay, so that's done. Um, we still have quite a lot of time till 645, so I'm wondering, should we sign the warrant? Well, we can do the, uh, the, the uh, appropriate folks have come in related to- uh, To Olympia Drive. Yeah, on Olympia Drive. Oh, okay, would you um, be so good as to explain both the article and the um, layout that the select board is going to Sure, so in, in your packet, uh, you have a, uh, a series of documents uh, with a cover memo from myself um, asking you to approve the layout of Olympia Drive as a public way. Um, that is a required and necessary uh, action step by the select board uh, prior to any town meeting consideration of uh, whether to formally accept the, the street. Um, that uh, layout uh, also in the packet uh, has been reviewed and uh, positively recommended by the town planning board at their meeting of October 3rd. Uh, you also have a, uh, an email that summarizes all the various action steps prepared by town council of which this is one of several uh, and then we have background materials um, from uh, uh, Doucette uh, Associates showing the, uh, the uh, uh, layout of the roadway itself. We have Dave Zomack is here tonight, uh, Rudy Perkins from HAP, and uh, their attorney, uh, uh, David Bloomberg, is here as well. And uh, all of these are precursors to uh, uh, the uh, planned uh, development of a 42 unit uh, uh, housing units, uh, affordable housing units uh, on town, uh, town land at the end of Olympia Drive and uh, included in this effort is a funding to upgrade the road which is currently uh, state-owned land. There's also a concurrent step underway uh, to pursue uh, special legislation uh, to release that property from state control to town control so it can in fact be a public way. Um, all of this is tied together, uh, including the uh, objective of uh, uh, securing grant funds for the upgrade of the road itself so that it's in an acceptable form to public way. I don't know if Dave or the others want to add anything. I'll be very brief because I believe your packet included quite a bit of information on this uh, on this topic, and I'll defer to Rudy um, on some of the specifics if you have specific questions. But as Mr. Musanti said, the planning board has reviewed the, the uh, layout and sent a memo to um, uh, the town manager and the select board. Um, uh, prior to that, uh, the town engineer, of course, uh, under the supervision of, of the superintendent, reviewed the layout as well and uh, concurred that it was uh, in the proper form. And I would also refer to, if you will, um, in your packet was a memo from Sharon Everett, uh, attorney from Copeland and Page, who very clearly in, a, in about a five-step uh, process memo uh, lays out the various steps, this being the logical next step um, in, the, in the process of, of accepting the, uh, the, the public way. So I think since this is an untimed item, this is one piece. I know there may be another discussion of the warrant article. I don't know if you have time to do that now, but we're specifically here tonight to seek your acceptance uh, and vote on the, the road layout. If Mr. Perkins wants to add anything, or Mr. Bloomberg? Um. Mr. Hayden? I just wanted to say that I, I'm, when we get to the end of this and our, our, um, the Olympia Oaks are built and the road is finished, I'm going to miss um, having this article come to us at every town meeting. <laughs> um, the point being that uh, this, is, um, this is the next step and what's been a long process. 
Right. Um, every step along the way has been um, met with uh, general approbation by town meeting. Town meeting has supported this um, with enthusiasm. Mm. So, so thank you. Okay, um, it's a two-step process tonight. The first is to have the motion uh, voted on on the actual um, uh, acceptance. Let's see how the motion actually <coughs> reads. Uh, we have to have the laying out, the official uh, laying out as a public way, and that has to come first. And my understanding from Mr. Musanti is that we're not going to actually uh, deal with the article tonight due to some legal uh, machinations that have to occur. Right, and that's, that's a process that's well underway and we're, we're quite confident we'll be there prior to town meeting right. about uh, funding, you know, securing funding for the road improvements themselves, which is tied together with, with the street acceptance. And I know town staff and town council are working closely with the HAP team uh, to make that happen. So we would expect the, the asking the select board to take a formal position on the article itself um, at, as early as your next meeting, which is November 5th, but well in advance of the fall town meeting. So my point would really be that the layout of Olympia Drive is a public way. That motion would, would go forward, would this go forward tonight, yeah. but that Mr. Perkins would not need to stay for a discussion of Article 7 because we're really not going to deal with that right. till a future date when... Right. Yep. Okay. Um, does anyone on the select board have any further questions on the layout of Olympia Drive as a public way? All set. Okay. Alyssa, would you like to nope. make? No? I <laughs> okay. just wanted to make sure that we were set with the funding portion of it, and we will be, so. Okay. Would you like to make the motion? Is the motion at the bottom of our motion sheet still the correct one? Yes, yes. it is. The, the other same. was the Great. earlier one. The, I move that the select board, having determined that common convenience and necessity require the layout of Olympia Drive as a public way, adopt an order of layout, laying out Olympia Drive as a public way as shown on a plan entitled Roadway Acceptance Plan, Olympia Drive and Authority Way, Amherst, Massachusetts, dated August 23, 2012, prepared by Doucette and Associates, and forward said layout and plan to the town clerk for filing. Second. Um, all, Mr. Hayden. This is the time for comment. I just wanted to, to uh, as, as my comment, uh, um, thank the, uh, the staff for having worked on this. Um, I know they've done a lot of work to get it in the right place and to get it all laid out and get it ready for us tonight, and uh, I appreciate that. And I'd like to note that prepared by is duplicated. Oh, so. yes, thank you. Okay. I only read it once. <laughs> <laughs> is there another correction? Any other? Okay. Are we ready to vote? Yes. All in favor say aye. Aye. All right, so it's three to zero. Two absent. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, so it is really close enough to um, 645, and I think Sandy. Mr. Pooler there is okay. here. And so we can go on with the first quarter budget update. Good evening. Um, thank Good you for evening. giving me the chance to present tonight. Uh, I'm going to go over the results of the town's operations from a financial point of view for the first quarter of FY13. Um, in other words, this last June, uh, excuse me, July, August, and September. So we're 25% of the way through the fiscal year. Um, and um, as you'll see in a minute, we have collected about 29% of our revenue and we have um, spent about 29% of our budgets. Although that is a little bit deceptive in both instances because in both instances as we go through the specifics, you'll see that because of the timing of certain things, um, some things have happened earlier to, so that 
you're not exactly matching that that 25 percent of the budget as we go through these reports later in the year when we're halfway and three quarters <coughs> and at the end of the year things tend to match up much better so it's a little bit early but um, I'd say the overall takeaway from the report is that 25% um, of the way through the year, we are on target for our major uh, revenue and expenditure categories. We have not noticed anything that is out of the ordinary or would be a signal for any particular problems. Um, and I'll go through some of the specifics on, on that uh, now. Uh, so just to review what we have here, there's a two-page memo here that uh, highlights some of the revenue and expenditure data. The uh, memo refers to um, the revenue pages that are on the third page here for the general fund and the enterprise funds. And then uh, the fourth and fifth pages are the expenditures. Um, so uh, really looking at the uh, major categories, uh, in recreation, and I'm going to include talking a little bit about uh, the golf course in here. Um, the golf course, we've collected 30% of our revenue, uh, which is, again, slightly more than 25%, but you'd expect that because they're not going to collect much revenue in the next few months. They do it all in the summer and the spring. Recreation shows 93% collected. Um, the reason for that is that Within that number, there's one big transfer that happens every year that comes from the revolving fund account to go into uh, the general fund. And that happens all at once. It's a transfer. Um, so it, uh, it just shows up as one big lump. Um, we do monitor, monitor that uh, separately and um, look at the individual programs, but that's, that's, a, that's a different discussion. Um, the other major categories, um, fines and forfeitures, are right on target. Interest income is, is pretty small here, but it represents only two months. And um, the timing of that is affected by when things like CDs come due. So um, I would the fact that there's only 3.6% of revenue shown here uh, does not reflect that we have a major gap in our, our interest revenue. That, in fact, is on target. Um, other things are... Uh, Moving right along, license and permits, um, motor, motor vehicle excise tax. Again, a very small number because you get the bulk of that, probably three quarters to 80% of that revenue comes in in March when we send out those bills. Um, I'm just going to skip down to uh, some of the bigger numbers here. The, the pilot number, uh, I know one of the members asked me about an email. I'll just mentioned, again, that's a timing thing. Uh, these are payment in lieu of taxes uh, from certain institutions and um, from uh, the enterprise funds, and those were paid all in one big lump in uh, some instances. Probably the most important thing to look at from a revenue point of view are our property taxes. Uh, that's our biggest source of revenue. Um, we've collected 26%, 25% of the way through the year, um, so that's right on target. Um, and our state aid is coming in um, <coughs> at an expected level. Uh, and our revenue from the enterprise funds is all flowing in, again, I think, right on target. On the expenditure side, um, the reason that you're going to see some of these departments um, spending above their 25% target is because Within expenditures, we include encumbrances, and there are some departments, such as uh, IT is a very good example, where they encumber contracts for services uh, early in the year. So you see a big jump in expenditures in the very beginning. Um, other than that caveat, I would say um, we are right on target for our spending. Our biggest departments, uh, DPW and police and fire, that have the bulk of our staffing, uh, their spending levels for salaries and so forth are at or below um, where we expect them to be. Um, so uh, I think we're in good shape that way. Um, I just want to mention one thing specifically because I realize we didn't put it in the details of the revenue report, but um, it is important. Under other excise, that reflects 
the hotel motel tax and the meals tax. And uh, we've collected $193,000 uh, so far this year. Of that, 99881 has come from the hotel motel tax, and 99183 has come from the meals tax. Um, interestingly, the meals tax is at 24% of our, our forecast, so you know it's, it's, it's right on target. The hotel motel tax is at 39%. It's running ahead, and I think that's because, um, mostly because we do see the, the Lord Jeff opened. We had adjusted the... Um, the estimate somewhat, but it does reflect the fact that they're really coming in um, at a much higher rate than they had in the past. And I know that that's, uh, people of, often want to know how that's coming in, and, and that's in fact what's happening, so it, it's doing well. Um, with that, I'd be happy to answer questions that the board members may have. <coughs> The stock market has uh, risen quite a lot in the last year. Has that in any way impacted our investments or, or are they protected by being very conservative and therefore we're not going to see much change from? And yeah, that's a good question because the investment income that you see here is investment on uh, basically our cash position. Those, by law, are restricted to short-term investments, so it's the short-term interest rates. Just by and by, I think in a year where you see a big increase in the stock market, the effect on the town would be twofold in the long run. One would be on our pension obligations, the Hampshire County Retirement Board, and although it takes a couple of years to, for that to sort of roll out in, on our assessments. Um, the other is the extent that we have trust funds or uh, as we'll get to in a minute, um, when we're talking about having an OPEB fund, if we can invest that, you would see the effect of uh, stock market gains on those sort of long-term investments. Thank you. That's very helpful. Other comments, questions? Thank you very much. It's Oh, there is one. Ms. Brewer. Um, I'm just trying, and I, I'm not following it well enough, my own notes, it's my, which is my fault. Um, when we had the year-end report, we yeah. talked about recreation and what we were going to be looking at in terms of perhaps changed expectations this year, et cetera. But in terms of where we're at, um, just in terms of these quarterly reports, where is the revenue falling? And you talked about the golf course, for example, and of course, based on its season, you know, we do expect not necessarily things to fit into nice quarters, but at certain times of year. Um, are are other recreation areas, you know, on target at this point? Or um, yes, no. I know, for example, the softball is way ahead of ex expectations. Okay. <laughs> so there's variation. Yeah, right. Okay. So it's a little too soon to say, perhaps. Okay. Right. Well, thank you very much. You're welcome. And uh, we are essentially at 655. So I think we can go into the section on um, the articles uh, for the town meeting warrant articles that uh, we are discussing tonight. And what's actually going to happen tonight is that we're going to have an overview of these articles and we're going to have presentations from members of staff on several of the town meeting warrant articles and the select board can ask questions about them um, but the, due to circumstances beyond our control we did not receive some of the background reading material in our packets so we're not really ready to take positions on these, formal positions on these articles this evening, but we'll do so at a later select board meeting. And then as we noted earlier, Article 7 uh, will not be considered uh, tonight as Mr. Musanti explained because we need um, some legal work to be done before we can consider that one. So the first article, um, is uh, Article 3, and I think 
um, Mr. Pooler will probably discuss that and Article 4. It's nice to see you again. <laughs> <laughs> Such a long absence. Um, I think something was emailed to you. I don't know if you yes. have. Okay. Yes, we got it by email. Very good. Um, so Article 3 is uh, for an appropriation of $585,342 into um, the OPEB trust fund. Um, just to, to remind people very quickly what the OPEB trust fund is, uh, about two years ago, town meeting adopted a state law that allowed cities and towns to set up trust funds uh, to put aside money for long-term obligations to fund retiree health insurance. Um, that's OPEB, uh, otherwise known as, um, I'm blanking, other than, other post-employment benefits. Thank yes. you. Um, we have an actuarial study that shows that we have about um, a $72 million liability in these funds. Um, that study was done two years ago. We're in the midst of having another study done now to update those figures. Um, and what we've been talking about with the Finance Committee and, and generally at the staff level is trying to make a start at putting money aside to, to try to meet that obligation. Um, it's just like a pension obligation where once, once people are employed, and they start working for a certain number of years, they'll be entitled to uh, certain benefits at the retirement, and in order to have money set aside for them at that time, you start to set money aside now. One of the fortunate things for our budget in FY13 is that after town meeting, the legislature passed the state budget, <coughs> and it um, restored funding, uh, state aid funding uh, for the general, uh, state aid uh, to cities and towns across the state, and for Amherst it meant an increase of um, over $500,000. As we've been doing the final numbers on the FY13 num uh, budget and submitting our recap sheet to the state to get ready to set our tax rate, um, we realized that with that extra state aid and a few other minor adjustments, there is $585,000 $342 in revenue that is going to come into the town in FY13 over and above what town meeting appropriated. Um, so it is, in one sense, um, extra. Um, it, won't, it won't be extra in future years. It will get, it's getting used up in future years, so it's a good time to do a one-time allocation of those funds for a useful purpose, and the recommendation here is that that useful purpose be the OPEB trust fund. Um, so um, I think it will be a good start for us in getting our foot in the door on funding OPEB. I think it will send a good message to uh, the rating agencies and also um, to our uh, retirees and to taxpayers to know that we are being responsible and starting to set money aside for this purpose. Um, I'd be happy to answer questions about that or keep going on to the next item depending on what your pleasure is. Does anybody have a question for Mr. Pooler about the OPED funds or uh, any materials at this point? Uh, Ms. Brewer? This is where I should really refine this sentence before I get to town meeting, <laughs> but this is the part where I say, um, even if we put the money into OPEB, it isn't completely untouchable in that it is. it can be used for current employees and currently retired employees health insurance if we were to need to do so. So if some significant change in our budget practice needed to take place, it isn't that this would be you know, untouchable money that could never have anything to do with our current needs. Yeah, I, I just would put one caveat on yes. that. And that is, um, I believe under the state law, and I will double check this, but um, I believe under the state law it can be used for the expenses, of, uh, the retired health insurance expenses of retirees. Okay. But not current employees, not, not but current employees. Cur currently retired, so to speak, yes. employees, yes. as opposed to futurely retired employees. That's All right. right. Got it. Thank you. 
Okay. Um, one of the things you mentioned earlier is the fact that in that fund, it could grow. So that would be a good thing for us um, in several ways. Absolutely. That's the whole idea. If, if you can make your money work for you over time, um, it's a good investment. Again, it's, it's the exact same strategy we have for funding our pensions. Um, the town has been doing that uh, since the mid-'80s, and uh, so now we're moving on to do that with our health insurance. Great. Okay. Um, since we're not going to take a position on the articles, I think we should probably wait to assign them as well. Are we go I wasn't sure if we were going to be waiting on these two articles, as we are on the others, because these were ones that we had discussed previously. But um, I had thought we were going to defer on all of them because okay. we didn't have the background material in our okay. physical hands. That's but, right. Um, yeah, and I, I guess it's a good point. We have been seeing a lot of this, yes. and we've we've it's it's part of our uh, financial guidelines and a whole bunch of stuff. Mm -hmm. But um, for our um, our uh, audience at home, they haven't had a chance to think about it and, and be in touch with us about it. So that might make sense. Okay, so we'll postpone. Although I intend to speak to it and better we might than as I well did tonight. wait on the <laughs> assignment. Okay, so Mr. Pooler, if you would like to move on to Article Four. Yes, I would. Thank you very much. Um, town, uh, town financial policies say that our combined free cash and stabilization should be maintained at between 5 and 15 percent of our general fund operating revenues. It also says that if our free cash balance uh, exceeds 5 percent of the general fund operating revenues, then uh, the excess of that 5 percent may be appropriated into the stabilization fund. And so what um, the suggestion here is, is that uh, now that we know what our free cash is uh, for coming out of FY12, our FY13 free cash, uh, we got that certification just last week, um, that we m keep 5% of the operating budget in free cash and appropriate the rest of it into the stabilization fund. Um, I'm going to ask you to turn to... Um, the graphs that are on the second page of the memo I handed out. Um, in the graph. Okay. There's, at the top of the page is a blue graph that shows um, what our combined free cash and stabilization total fund balances were over the years. And you can see going back to 2001 up through um, the current year, 2013, uh, we hit a high point in those funds in 2002 at $9.2 million. And then, because of difficult uh, economic challenges and cuts in state aid and so forth, we drew those down um, to hit a low point of $3.8 in 2006. Um, for several years, it stayed fairly stable. And then in the last three years, we've slowly started to build um, those funds up. Um, and the FY13 number is what it, the combined free cash and stabilization fund uh, would be. Um, regardless of whether you do this transfer, just the two of them together. Um, but it does show that overall what we want to do is get back to a point where our free cash and stabilization fund balances um, are more in that uh, the mid-range of that 5 to 15 percent range. Um, and if we make this transfer, um, they will be at 9.3 percent. The bottom graph shows um, of the sources of those reserve funds. The blue part would be uh, free cash. These are our actual numbers in the past. The, the red part is the stabilization fund. So for FY13, what the proposal is, is um, have free cash be at $3.3 million, um, transfer money from free cash into, st into stabilization. That's the $1 million at the top. And we already have $1.8 million in stabilization now from a transfer that was done last fall at, t at town meeting where we put 400000 in there. Um, I would then refer you back to the first page of the memo. And I have to say, um, I did this memo this afternoon. And there's a couple of typos in here that I'm noticing. So I would like ask you to focus 
on the numbers in the grid at the bottom. Um, those, any, any, anything, everything under results is accurate. Um, the th there are a couple of numbers at the top that, where it says free cash above 5%, where it's an old number that I was using before we have our final certification of free cash from the state. Um, but we do have our free cash certified. It's $4.3 million. 5% of that would be 3.3 million. And so there's an excess of $1 million um, $2,440 that could be transferred into the stabilization fund. If we make that transfer, um, we would then have um, a total of $2.8 million in stabilization fund and a total of $6.2 million in our total free cash plus stabilization. Again, that equaling 9.3% of our budget. Okay, just Mr. Hayden. You, I, I didn't mean to interrupt. No, but, no, um, you're, you're, you come first. I just wanted to uh, um, make a point that has been made before to us here that this, um, this process of moving things into stabilization and all has played a role in um, um, <clears throat> our being able to get a very good r rating on our uh, borrowing. Um, so while it seems maybe a, sort of a mundane thing, it turns out to have some important consequences. And I appreciate the reports that we've been seeing with the red and the green and the, in this case, the green mark saying that's a good thing. Right. And I guess I would just add to it that um, we can spend money from either account. It just takes a greater vote from the stabilization account from town meeting, two thirds. Require, stabilization fund requires a two thirds vote to spend from it. But free cash is only. Free cash is a simple majority. Simple majority. Um, so stabilization is an explicit separate fund that is invested and earns its own interest and really is our long term uh, reserve account. Um, and so what's being recommended is consistent with the financial policies that were developed uh, with the finance committee and staff a number of years ago uh, that, you know, we have a goal of uh, maintaining reserves between 5 and 15 percent of annual operating revenue. This, this activity gets us over 9 percent uh, right in the middle of that, and it's a very prudent thing to do. Uh, planning for the inevitable next downturn, it'll be out there. With, you know, the economy obviously goes in cycles, and... Uh, this is another action step the town can take to you know, protect us and protect our services that we try to fund uh, when that inevitable next time happens. Are there other questions? Ms. Brewer. Actually, a couple of comments. One is that um, based on what some, one sometimes reads in newspapers about other communities, they sometimes seem a little unclear on what their free cash might end up being, but we are always really good at predicting what our free <laughs> cash is, and so we should be pleased with that. It's another good sign of our good budgeting. And the other comment I had is in regards to the financial policies that we're referring to, that um, those are available on the town website. They should be linked from the FY14 page, although I haven't gone and looked recently. So those are not like some you know, mythical policy from 400 years ago. Those are things that we are very currently looking at and the select board continues to refer to in our budget guidelines as well. Other comments? Okay, I guess we again are not going to take a position. So you are free, Mr. Pooler, and thank you very much. Thank you, good night. Okay, the next article we're going to discuss is Article 9, which is the ban of EPS foam in restaurants. And I know that Susan Waite is here. And um, please introduce yourself, and if any of your colleagues are gonna come up there with you, they should do the same. Okay. My name is Susan Waite. I'm the Recycling Coordinator for the Town of Amherst. I work for Guilford Mooring at the Department of Public Works. And I am joined here tonight by four, used to be four, of the Recycling and Refuse Management Committee members. We have, oh, it is four. We have Laurel Dickey over here on the left, Brenda Kennedy Davies next to her. Behind them is Sue Morello, and to Sue's right, left, 
Left is Christina Cox Fernandez. Thank you. You're welcome. So I have been elected. I'm uh, here representing the Recycling and Refuse Management Committee about this article. The article is essentially to ban the use of expanded polystyrene foam single-use containers from restaurants in Amherst and from um, users of town facilities. Uh, they would be prevented from dispensing them. The key reason why we feel that this is a really important issue to handle now um, are that, first of all, extend, expanded polystyrene foam is extremely bulky. It weighs virtually nothing, and you'll find that the manufacturers often emphasize how little it makes up the solid municipal waste stream by weight. It weighs virtually nothing. The an amount of paper, um, if this was filled with reams of paper, the equivalent amount of weight in polystyrene, expanded polystyrene, would be the size of a refrigerator. So this material is filling up our landfills, which are quickly uh, reaching the end of their lifespan, and if it is incinerated as 50% of the municipal solid waste in Massachusetts is, then that material is going potentially um, into air quality uh, confusion. <laughs> so that, that's one reason. Um, it's also not biodegradable. It's photodegradable, which um, light does not hit it in, inside a landfill, and it's impractical to recycle. I can go into detail about that uh, because some people have arguments the other way, but I'm happy to take them on. Um, local landfills are cl closing. Uh, as you may know, we have three landfills that are not too far, but all three of them will be closing in the next three years, some of them sooner than that. It was classified, that is styrene, was classified as a human carcinogen by the National Toxicology Program, which is part of the Department of Health and Human Services, last year. So that was in 2011. Um, so that's another timely reason why now that might be a good time. We believe Amherst is ready for it. In 1987, this uh, a ban was brought before the town meeting in Amherst. And I'm not sure exactly what happened to it. Some people think that it was passed, but the town um, clerk tells me it was not passed. So we figure 20-some uh, years later, we might be better prepared to take this one on. The Taste of Amherst recently occurred in June, and it was, for the first time, a pretty much trash-free event. We composted, and uh, I think the Chamber of Commerce and some local restaurants really saw that it was doable to do this. Uh, all of the 20-some restaurants were, were approached and explained that, that foam was not going to be allowed. They had to use something um, compostable. And it was a really successful event, and I think Tony Maroulis and, and other people were just really thrilled at how easy it was. Um, it, it was not as big of a burden and a, and a fight as they thought that it might be. Um, as you know, may know, lots of other communities in the United States have started on this path. The city of Seattle has banned, not only banned styrofoam, but has made all restaurants use compostable material, and all restaurants must compost. In addition, Great Barrington in here in Massachusetts, Nantucket, and um, uh, they, all, they both have bans uh, for styrene or polysty expanded polystyrene. And um, most recently, the town of Brookline is also um, pretty, pretty far along in their, um, in their efforts to make it happen. This is part of a bigger vision that the Ref Refuse um, and Recycling Management Committee is looking at, which is looking at how we can reduce our waste stream in general. You might have heard about the zero waste movements in other parts of the country and in Europe. And indeed, uh, I think the whole country of New Zealand has adopted a zero waste approach as well, where it's looking at, um, looking at what we throw away and making sure that, that there aren't things that we can be pulling out and um, using in a better way, in a better fashion, um, that it's a resource and not, it's not waste till it's wasted. So this is a, a first step that the Recycling Committee sees in a larger movement. And we also think that at this point, it's kind of low-hanging fruit in that, based on some of our research, only 30% or fewer of the restaurants in Amherst are currently using expanded polystyrene. Um, it's easy to identify. 
It um, is used for hot food, which is um, a potential concern based on some of the health issues. Um, so we, we just feel that it's a, a good time to pursue it right now. Okay. Are there questions? Mr. Hayden. Yeah, I have three questions, two of which you've answered already. Mm -hmm. But the, the third um, is that, um, first of all, I'd like you to, to describe uh, the work that you've done to be in, in the contact with the restaurants and to, sure. to figure out the alternative or figure out where they might go for alternative material, compostable Sh material. Sure. But well, the question oh, is, yeah. What about the restaurants which are not local? I'm thinking that we've got three chains mm -hmm. in, in town that mm -hmm. um, probably are required or have some impetus to use uh, expanded polystyrene um, from headquarters. Sure. Well, the committee, um, oh, I forgot a very, very important piece. The committee has been working in conjunction with the Amherst League of Women Voters and the Hitchcock Center for the Environment to push this issue forward. They've been, they, both groups have been really terrific um, in supporting the whole process and we thank them and we, we consider ourselves a team with them and I apologize for not mentioning that sooner. So the group has, um, after, they took their information about which restaurants that are known users of foam and they have been visiting them with information, with samples of, of alternatives to foam, with um, information about what we're doing, letting them know that we're pursuing this at town meeting, and um, telling them that we are hoping to help with them, help them and, and work in conjunction with them to, to find solutions. One of the solutions that we're pursuing is that we are we have identified a supplier in Greenfield who is interested in the possibility of making a uh, buying consortium for small business owners here in Amherst that might help them reduce the price of, of uh, alternatives to foam. Foam is extremely, extremely cheap to buy. It's really easy to make. It's a real profit center for, for those who make it. Um, it's essentially blowing air into polystyrene. And so it's inexpensive to produce. It's the hind end of the, of the lifespan that, that we are most concerned if, with. Um, so it's very cheap to purchase in, com in comparison with some other things. But the, other, the prices of the other products that are alternatives are coming down. And this buying consortium that we're working on would potentially allow not only the the supplier to go back to their manufacturers and say, hey, there's a potential market here that I'm, we're working on building, and if you can help us ease some of the prices, we can, we can build this market. So it's going to give them some leverage with their suppliers, and it'll give Amherst, community, Amherst restaurants a, possi a possible uh, venue for reduced prices also. Um, that being said, the prices are already coming down. When people first started looking at this about four years ago or more, the price com comparison was much, um, the gap was much greater than it is today. So that's, that's part of what we've been doing with the local groups. We are also going to be running an ad in the Amherst Bulletin uh, explaining why we're pursuing this at that at this time, and and having a list of restaurants in Amherst that do not use foam at this right now, and and don't plan on using it, and kind of thanking them for for um, for doing what they're doing. So that's uh, we have visited over the last three or four weeks uh, about 30 restaurants or so, and for the most part the results have been, uh, people have come back and said things were very positive. People want to do, want to make a change. Some of them have a harder time financially doing so. Some of them have already made the change uh, since we identified them as using foam. So then some of them were very enthusiastic about the concept of the buying consortium. So, so it's, uh, and some of them only use it for one item in their restaurant. So, you know, we only use it for soup or we only use it for this or that. So it's not, um, often it's not the situation where, where they, they're using tons and tons of it. Okay. Um, there are a few of those situations, but. I, I have a couple of quick questions. Mm -hmm. um, the first is, if this, and I'm sorry that I haven't read it in uh, article in enough detail mm -hmm. to be sure, but um, would there, what would the effective date for adoption 
of this mm -hmm. article be? The effective date as written is July 1st, 2013. Okay. Um, so that people would have more than six months to mm -hmm. sort of get mm -hmm. phased out of their stocks. Right, right. Uh -huh. um, the second one was on a cost basis, um, how many cents would moving from styrofoam, from expanded foam to paper or plastic, um, what's the price differential? I'm, uh, we don't have, I'm embarrassed to say, we don't have that information yet. We're in the process of getting it. Part of the problem is that for me to call suppliers is kind of a shot in the dark because I, they don't know how much I'd be ordering. They don't know what I'd be ordering. They don't know what I'm ordering now. So we're going to be working with a couple restaurants to work through them to find out what their suppliers say would what the price differential yeah. would be. I, I did a little looking on the web. Mm -hmm. You can get a lot of information there about different mm -hmm. paper products and plastic ones, and it's surprisingly reasonable. As, Didn't used to one. be. Yeah. Didn't used to be, but I think that's definitely the trend. No, I'm saying it's, it's reasonable. Mm -hmm. It's not expensive. Mm -hmm. Other questions or comments? Ms. Brewer. I have a few, and um, for those of you who are more interested in zoning articles than this particular article, please don't feel bad if we don't ask nearly as many questions about the zoning articles yet, because we haven't read lots of pages associated with that. But this we've had a little more information on ahead of time, and you know it's one of those things you see in restaurants, so it's a little easier to get your hands around. You've mentioned here in the article itself that UMass, Amherst College, mm -hmm. Hampshire College are already on board, which is great. Mm -hmm. Are there any town or school uses currently? Is the town or the school side using these products at this point? Not that I'm aware of. Well, well, I should, and there's a caveat to that. The uh, Whitson's Culinary Group is the school mm -hmm. um, school uh, food service provider. They, their predecessor did use foam disposable trays in all of the schools. Whitson's, since they have come on board, has been using bamboo trays, uh, bamboo fiber trays, which are compostable. And at our middle, at our elementary schools, we have compost programs. So. Um, probably, you know, a, a mass, vast majority of those are going into the compost. There, um, I don't know about um, any other kind of auxiliary services like, uh, I guess, soup kitchens wouldn't necessarily be a, a town event. Um, there might be some auxiliary ones, but um, the schools might still use it at the high school um, for soups. I'm not sure, I need to double check. I need to um, give them a call and be in touch with them. But they, they, for the most part, do not, they might use it for soups and oatmeal. I don't recall what they were using. But they do not use it for the, the trays. That, that's great that mm -hmm. they aren't using it for the trays. I think it would just be nice to be able to confirm that for town meeting, just like it's nice to sure. be able to say about UMass, et cetera. Mm -hmm. In terms of one of your handouts here that we just received today, talks about materials to look for and materials to mm -hmm. avoid. Mm -hmm. One of the things I'm confused by in the box of materials to avoid, I can see on the left-hand side where it includes the foil and the more things that we think of as like cardboard and mm -hmm. paper use mm -hmm. as being appropriate things to use. Materials to avoid all look like white styrofoam to me except for what looks like a takeout box that's right. the cute little foldable. So is that because it's so heavily weighted toward the white compost, right. toward well, the white styrofoam. Is that because it's waxed cardboard? It's not waxed. Unfortunately, there's a plastic lining. Oh, that's a and plastic that's lining. A, in there's a, a plastic lining in the folded in that. We do have, there are versions of those, like the ones used at Whole Foods and others that are, that are not, that are waxed and they are not, they don't have a plastic lining. But those particular things, commercial composters do not want because of the plastic lining. So a waxed cardboard is waxed appropriate. Waxed cardboard is, they love it. It's they get the lots of it from produce. Lining. Yeah. That's the problem. Yep. Yep. Okay, good, thank you. Other questions? Mr. Musanti, did you want to make a comment? Um, on, the, on the schools, I mean, one of the practical considerations on the recommended effective date of July 1 of 2013 was mm -hmm. to get us beyond of the academic right. year so that mm -hmm. we're not introducing a regulatory change, you mm -hmm. know, with 45 days to go in the school year. So that was done on purpose. Um, 
And the only other thing I'll say is to thank Susan and the members of the committee who have been laboring for at least the last two years on this. And to me, it's an on. <laughs> to me, it's analogous to the work that was done on a different but similar issue, the uh, building stretch code related to our green communities uh, aspirations. Uh, there was, m that process was marked by a lot of outreach to potentially affected uh, customers, which in that case was the building contractor community. And there was a lot of education and uh, question and answer thing going on. And the same has been true on the expanded polystyrene with the outreach through to businesses and the visitations to restaurants, et cetera. So that's just wanted to note that it's great staff and committee work. Mr. Wald? Yeah, just thank you very much for a, a detailed and thorough presentation. It's very helpful. It's a, I think it's a, it's a great move. And, you know, one would hope also not that people decide to do their shopping on the basis of compostability, but that, you know, if we establish the town's reputation as a green town, especially given the number of restaurants here, that's kind of a plus, too. You know, you'd hope you would attract shoppers if they have a choice who would prefer to do their eating in Amherst than somewhere else mm -hmm. because of our ethos as well as the quality of the product. So. Sure. I had a, thank you. I had a conversation today with the health inspector from Great Barrington, Massachusetts, and he was explaining, they've had their ban in effect for over 20 years, but he was explaining how proud the community is and, and that there really is very little pushback. Um, he said that uh, when, uh, uh, you know, an occasional, uh, an occasional voice of especially after the market crash in 2008, but he said for the most part everyone is very supportive and they have a, a, a not only a population base but visitors that appreciate the, the Great. green, you know, ethos. The aspect, yes. right. Yes. Thank you so much. Uh, you. We appreciate it. I do think we need to move on. And I see a couple of faces in the audience that I don't know was somebody here to speak on this or okay all right then we will move on um the next uh is article 10 public water supply protection and, and tonight we have planning director jonathan tucker and rob crowner from the planning board to uh, give you a, an overview on these articles So the, the first article is, is uh, actually all these articles are, are really just the, the pregame. It's, it's next time around when, when the really exciting stuff happens. <laughs> um, the first article is, is, uh, is really a, a so-called technical fix. Um, it just adds a reference to state law um, regarding uh, water uh, supply protection. Um, it doesn't change the regulation. The regulation is already there. Um, but it but it adds the language uh, of the state law to to our zoning bylaw, so that um, when when uh, watershed protection district is affected, you know to go to the right place in state law. It seemed very straightforward to me. Do yep. any members of the select board wish to ask questions or comment? Yeah, just just a couple of uh, a quick things. I'm, I'm, you know, sort of digesting all of this. Um, what is Zone One, Two, and Three, and A, B, C, and, and um, do we have those, or is that assigned to us by the same state uh, regulating body that created the regulation that we're referring to now? Yeah, those 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 are state state designations. They're not part of this error by law. Um, I don't know exactly what they are. <laughs> All right, I guess we're ready to move on to Article 11. Um, 11 is lodging and boarding house definition. This is just um, um, adding a definition uh, that does not exist, although we have the use, and we, we um, already regulate the use um, in the use chart. We also regulate the use um, um, somewhat differently in, in uh, um, accessory uses in, in Article 5 of the zoning bylaw. So it's, it's lodging and boarding house. Um, what that does is um, it, it, it describes what exactly we mean when we, when we refer to lodging and boarding house in the zoning bylaw. 
Um, a lodging or boarding house is a place where rooms are rented out, rooms not dwelling units, um, by a resident owner or manager. And it, it's, up, it's from uh, six to 10 rooms. So uh, the reason for this is um, when we are discussing, when we were discussing uh, the other residential use amendments that we're gonna be proposing, um, there's often reference to a lodging house or a boarding house, um, but we need to have a common understanding of what that is. Uh, that, that definition or that definition is implicit in the zoning bylaw, but it's not actually stated right now. So we're proposing to add it so that um, everyone knows what we're talking about. Questions, comments? It's Brewer. Well, obviously we haven't seen this in detail and so we'll take a look at it. But um, two, one really easy question and then uh, a more, slightly more complicated one. The really easy question is, I do not recall from my zoning bylaw if cooking facilities include the definition of microwaves. Or are we talking about stoves and hot plates and that sort of thing? What does that mean, really? Um. <laughs> the, the actual term in the bylaw is kitchens. Kitchens. Rather than cooking facilities. OK. Um, when you're talking about a dwelling unit under the state building code, it has sleeping rooms, it has sanitary facilities, <clears throat> and it has ki kitchens. And if you have all three of those, it's a dwelling un unit, no matter how small or, or how it's arranged. Uh, since this use is intended to not be renting uh, dwelling units, but instead to be renting rooms, they may in some cases have sanitary facilities associated with them or not. Um, the, dis the distinction between these and dwelling units is the absence of kitchens. And then the slightly more complicated question is, um, again, since I don't have time to read what it said happened at the public hearing. Is there anything in particular that jumped out during this discussion that you think will become an issue associated with this? There was any particular point of concern that anyone raised during discussions either amongst yourselves or at the public hearing? Um, so I, I don't think there will be. Um, there was some discussion at the public hearing, but we incorporated the uh, response to that into the, into the wording. So there shouldn't be anything left over that's, that's controversial. Other questions? I guess I do have a question. Are, this term would now apply to the kind of houses that have four unrelated students in them? Is that, is that considered now a boarding house? No, a boarding I house. Mean, a uh, lodging or boarding house. A lodging or boarding house, um, the owner is resident on, on site or there's a, a manager who, who resides on site and you're only renting rooms, individual rooms. Okay. Um, so. It's not, it's not a, a group living situation, it's, it's, it's um, just renting rooms. Do we have places like this now? We have a few, actually, we have a few that are recognized. Okay. <laughs> uh, we probably have <laughs> quite a few uh, that are not recognized. Uh, there's one on uh, South Prospect Street been a long-standing. This um, SROs would also fall into this this category. Uh, yeah. This has it is a a use that has been in existence in Amherst since probably the late 19th century or earlier in response to the growth of the first um, Massachusetts Agricultural College and and uh, as the institution grew, we probably have these all over. Uh, but in terms of what is being regulated here, it is these as a principal use. There are also, in the bylaw, uh, as Mr. Crowner referred to, there are provisions that allow someone to use their single family residence, which is the principal use, in an accessory fashion to let rooms to one to three individuals by right, or four to six people by special permit. That's not the same thing. Those are still single family residences. That's the dominant use on the site. In these cases, a lodging or boarding house, the dominant use of the property is to, for lodging and boarding. Uh, that's what it's uh, principally for, and that's what this is intended to regulate. And again, all that we're doing here, although we're making, we're adding a few uh, regulations that weren't there before, is we're adding a definition that was missing. Other questions? I'm sorry, so it's, without belaboring this too much, because I'll obviously read more about it, um, 
again, obviously we have a few. They certainly more than likely predated the idea of taking mm -hmm. a three-bedroom cape and trying to turn a regular three-bedroom cape into a student rental. I mean, lodging and boarding houses have a great history in our country for all sorts of reasons. Um, at this point, we are not seeing many conversions to that, I should think, in that you would have to have a fairly substantial property in order to do that, given that a minimum of six rooms is what qualifies you as a lodging. So this is not something that's going to be like a 1949 cape is going to be turned into this. In theory, a Victorian of some sort might be. Am I sort of understanding the scope of what we're talking about? Uh, it's actually persons, not rooms. Six okay. to ten persons, and the number of rooms is not specified. Okay, so it could be. Six persons would be above the foreign related limitation. Right. So um, for the occupancy of a single dwelling unit. Okay, that's the, this is distinguished from a dwelling unit. This is a lodging or boarding house. That's part of the difference here. It's a distinct principal use and regulated in that way. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay. <laughs> I'm still having a little trouble getting my head around what, how, I, I appreciate that we have to put the definition in, you know, that, that would be useful, obviously. But in terms of understanding where this positions us in terms of our future discussions about neighborhoods, et cetera, and trying to keep track, apparent, you know, possibly through some sort of rental registration system, this would, if it were to be included in such a thing, would need to be included in kind of a separate way, and that it is a different sort of thing than than renting out, than having a house that's been turned into a rental. Yes. Okay. Further questions or comments? <clears throat> okay, then we can move on to the last zoning article for tonight, residential zoning definition. So, so the, these are uh, more definitions that arose in um, missing or, or definitions that need to be slightly revised that arose in our discussion of, of the residential use amendments. Um, so again, it's, it's the reason is, is so that we have a, a, a common vocabulary. Um, we, we, understand, we, we are meaning something specific when we refer to various uh, terms in, in the zoning bylaw. So we're adding uh, a def definition for dwelling unit, which does not exist. Uh, again, a dwelling unit would include uh, the, the various uses, that, including kitchen and sanitary use, that, that are not necessarily uh, um, part of, of a room. Um, so all of those things would have to be present for a dwelling unit to exist. Uh, we're adding some revisions to uh, the definition of family or household. Um, th these are um, aspects of, of relationship that, that everyone knows exist, but, but are actually not in our bylaw. It, it, our bylaw appears to discriminate against civil unions. It appears to disc discriminate against um, um, custodial relationships. It appears to discriminate against uh, congregate housing. Um, so, so all these things are, are we, we understand them as, as um, being a family or a household, um, but they're not in our bylaw, so our bylaw sort of seems to disallow them. Um, we. We attempted to address the issue of four unrelated, um, possibly by um, developing a, a definition of functional family that might include uh, four or more or less uh, unrelated people. That's a bigger job than, than we anticipated, and, and we're going to come back to that um, hopefully in the spring. So this doesn't this does not um, change or or make any um, amendment to, to that part of, of a family. Um, adding a, a definition of uh, habitable space um, because our, a subsequent article will, um, on uh, converted dwellings, will um, refer to habitable space um, in, in a place where we currently talk about a footprint. Um, so we need to have um, um, a, a definition of, of what habitable space is. And again, habitable space is, is, is uh, um, similar to dwelling. It includes all the a, um, aspects of dwelling, but it's, it's, um, it's a way of measuring the space rather than um, um, describing the space. Um, a definition of principal residence. Um, 
this is uh, directly in in response to um, the idea that that places should be occupied um, by the person who owns them, um, but uh, um, ownership is does not necessarily mean uh, residence, and so we need to we need to um, explain what we mean by a, a principal residence so that when we refer to it, uh, we understand. And so a principal residence is 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 really the place where a person actually resides, and it, and it would be proven or demonstrated by a, a variety of things, including a declaration of homestead, uh, on the place where you file your taxes from, um, the place where you um, um, get your mail, and where, where you are listed on the street address, and so on. Um, um, I guess the next one is uh, resident manager. Resident manager, again, um, we're going to be proposing that um, for a special permit, a, the permit granting body would be able to require, as a condition of a permit, uh, a resident manager, among other things, if they wanted to, uh, or some other sort of management uh, um, service. So, so we need to have a, a definition of, of what a resident manager is, and that is someone who lives at the site and is responsible for managing the site. Um, so none of these uh, um, definitions specifically uh, uh, regulate, but they allow us to uh, regulate um, m more clearly and, and um, um, more directly than, than we currently do. Questions, Mr. Hayden? Uh, quick question, um, what are the qualifications? Qualifications for the rental resident manager. So, um, th okay, this this is a good question. Um, let me, let me um, preemptively answer um, Ms. Brewer's question. The controversial ones in this list are uh, resident manager and principal residents. Um, we can't possibly um, define all of the qualifications nor all of the aspects of what um, management is. What we're doing is, is, is allowing the permit granting body to, to use the definition to craft conditions for a permit that makes sense in the context of, of that permit. Um, that, that place in town, uh, that use, whatever it is. Um, so, so qualifications for a, a two-family home might be different than qualifications for uh, a six-unit apartment. Um, I would expect, or I guess I would hope, that when the uh, rental permitting system is, is developed, that there might be uh, a, a series of, of qualifications that, that um, apply to various um, kinds of, of management. Um, but we're not going to we're not going to define them in the zoning bylaw. We're, we're providing that as a tool for the permitting body to to use um, to issue a permit. Yeah, so as a, as a follow on to that, um, this then would be um, only an issue when a special permit is being considered. I mean, I know I know we haven't gotten to the next section yet, but is that where it fits in? That's exactly right. It's it's, it's um there are, there's no current um, requirement for resident manager on any use. Um, but but it, but if the subsequent articles are adopted by town meeting, um, they would they would empower the permanent granting body to require a resident manager if they wanted to. Other comments or questions, Ms. Brewer? Is there uh, again a recognizing that you can't do every little detail and that the purpose is to provide a starting point for the permitting body? Talking about principal residents um, is. There have been, I'm glancing at these, you know, it says illness, catastrophe, references our academic calendar, which is great. Um, what about the people who live half, four, three, six months in Florida every summer or, you know, North Carolina or wherever the current warm climate is? How is that considered? Uh, there's a provision in Massachusetts law um, that it says for purposes of, of a range of, of state uh, functions, uh, you have to declare what your primary, your principal residence is, whether it's in Massachusetts or somewhere else. 
um, that, and that is referenced in this. Right. That's so if someone's principal residence is actually in Florida and Massachusetts is just a summer thing or whatever, um, that would be noted in that, and caught in that way. Part of what this definition does is to try and describe enough different indices and then turn over to the zoning enforcement officer, or in some cases the permit granting body, responsibility for assessing in each individual case um, where, the, where the measure falls. Uh, what, uh, is this real or is this not? There, there was a great deal of discussion during, uh, actually the entire summer pretty, <laughs> pretty much, over uh, all of the ways in which people might artfully uh, find ways to game the system here because uh, rental property is such a substantial part of the economy of, of Amherst, there would be motivation to do that. And the way to get around that is, as I just described, is to create a range of, of indices and then allow the, the permit granting body or the zoning enforcement officer to make judgments in each individual case. That would apply also to the resident uh, manager situation. There was the, the feared circumstance I heard from often was, well, the, the, the owner will just assign one of the students, presuming it's a student rental, uh, will just say, you, you're the, you're the manager, right. you have to you know, give your name to the police and so forth in case there's, there's trouble. Um, by giving the permit granting bodies the ability to assess this and saying, using the word qualified, uh, hopefully you get around that. That's not to say that you might not encounter a 19 year old who had been part of a family that does you know, rental properties and had been doing this since they were 16 and were certified under mm -hmm. the state to do this. And you just, you need to be able to respond to the full range of, of possibility that's out there. And that's why the language is not as specific as some would be comfortable with. Other comments or questions? Mr. Hayden. Um, just a comment of appreciation. I, I've sat in a lot of the zoning subcommittee meetings where this stuff has been hashed out for the last several months. And um, I, I know that a great deal of information has gone both ways. And I, I just want to appreciate that. Okay. Thank you. I think we will move on then to our 740 item. We're running a little late. And that is this... Um, right of first refusal option on a parcel owned by Cal Coles um, on Flathill Road. This is uh, something we have voted on in the past with two other lots, as I recall. So um, as I remember, both the planning board and the conservation commission um, voted to refuse to um, buy the land, basically. They, I think it's called the right of refusal. Let me, yes, the right of first refusal. So would somebody like to either speak to the issue or make the motion for us? Well, uh, um, I just wanted to make a comment on this. We've mm -hmm. seen, um, now, I, I can't remember in which one of my lives I first saw this, whether I was on the planning board still or if this was a conversation that happened subsequent to that. But um, part of the reason that the Conservation Commission didn't um, recommend that we exercise um, uh, our option to purchase this, this, this parcel is that it did not include uh, habitat for sensitive uh, species it's not valuable that way I mean if, if you if you're familiar with it it's a kind of a grassy field on top of a hill um, but they didn't feel it was a had a huge value that way right it uh, it has been protected under chapter 51 but then they pay the difference uh, in taxes which comes to about 500 and some dollars that's right Ms. Brewer um, of course, we have in our packet, as we usually do, um, the position of the Conservation Commission and of the Planning Board. I noticed that the Planning Board was not a unanimous decision, though, and I just wondered if there was a particular concern that was raised associated with that that I don't see mentioned specifically. 
Usually I these are pretty straightforward. I know who had that concern. Do you want to say anything, Mr. Kroner? Mr. Kroner. So I, I was the person who voted against it. So obviously <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not representing the planning board. This is my, my position. Um, I felt that, that um, the planning board did not have a basis for making a recommendation on whether to exercise the right of first refusal or not. It, 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 there's a lot of factors. There's cost, there's a, you know the conservation plan, there's uh, conservation issues, there's the master plan, all these things. So I, I felt that, um, all right, and I do feel for all of these withdrawals is um, that we should be providing our input on, on, on how, it, how our expertise are from, from our sphere of, of um, contribution to the, to the town. Where does it fit? And, and, and to me, um, it, I think um, our, our master plan asks for um, directing growth, residential growth, to, to centers. And, and at the same time, protecting outlying areas. I consider this an outlying area. I consider uh, a development there to be sprawl development because there's no sidewalks. Um, it's not close to any services or shops or anything. So that doesn't mean that it, that it, it should be protected at any cost, obviously. But we don't, know, we don't know from the planning board, we know that what the purchase price was. We don't know what the context of, of the, of the long-range uh, funding for all conservation projects is. Um, so I, I thought that w the appropriate response should be um, um, it, that it meets uh, a minimum standard for protection. That is, um, our ma if we interpret our, our master plan very strictly, um, it, would, it would meet that, those standards for protection. Um, but then obviously you would have other factors to consider. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to mention, I, not having discussed this with you ahead of time, um, but having served with you on comp planning at some point associated with the master plan, I, that does bring up an interesting and valuable point associated with process beyond this particular project in general. One of the things I've often been heard to complain about at this venue is why are we signing off on something? Why are we asked our opinion on something if we have no control over mm -hmm. it or we don't feel like we have? Um, certain background information associated with it. Mostly it's that it's a state thing that we don't have any control over it that I end up complaining about. But in this case, it, it is quite clear what the Conservation Commission's role is in these, but it isn't as clear what Planning Board's role is and where that line is drawn as to how much information they should be expected to consider versus what we as a select board should be expected to consider because I think that basically our response over my years on the select board has been if the other boards sign off on it, we do too. And so if no one's really looking at, the Conservation Commission, I'm sure, to some extent, would look at the master plan. But given how important the master plan is to at least three of us at this, <laughs> <laughs> many more of us than that, um, I just want, I want to get a sense maybe from the town manager, although this is obviously completely you know, new comment. Um, where, where do, how do you perceive, you know, we only do these every so often, and when we do, we always have this huge amount of paper, and it all seems very straightforward, but maybe. Right, and in, in state law, uh, chapter six, chapter uh, 61. 61, section eight, gives the town an opportunity to exercise right of first refusal. Um, so the staff, uh, the Conservation Commission, and you know the Planning Board, by a vote of seven to one, um, felt that this parcel is such that it doesn't uh, suggest the town exercise its right of first refusal. So they've done that in the context uh, of master plan and, and other things. Um, so the recommendation is to um, not exercise the town's right of first refusal. Mr. Hayden. Yeah, I, I would want to develop the idea a little bit further because I, I've been um, in a similar position thinking about this in a past life, as I mentioned. Um, there are many ways that a parcel of land can be protected from development. The master plan, in fact, refers to a couple of them and suggests developing some tools that we're just beginning to, to think about now as far as, as moving around development rights. 
Um, the, the, the chapter 61 process is one. It's not a very good one. It's not like an APR process, for instance, or uh, purchasing the land outright and turning it into, you know, or having the Kestrel Fund come in or some other way, some other mechanism. It is an imperfect one. Um, it has this rigid process. And um, that's the one we're engaged in now. Um, in a way, um, I hope that Mr. Crowner's concern would excite um, people uh, to engage the other ways of preserving this plot, this parcel. Um, but as far as this one process is concerned, you know, the decision is kind of straightforward, whether or not the town should buy it to protect it. Other comments, Mr. Walt? Yeah, I tend to defer here to the opinion of the Conservation Commission and the Planning Board majority, but again, like others here, I've worked very closely and enjoyably with Mr. Crowner on the master plan for longer than I care to think about sometimes. Uh, and one of the things that was so good about that was the kind of intense debate we had about fine points of policy and, and wording. So I really am very grateful to Mr. Crowner for bringing out these, <coughs> these subtleties here, even if they may not affect the outcome, because I think they are important. I guess the way I understand things, when, I, when we say the town will direct growth here or there, we do it more actively through zoning. I mean, it's a little bit like the historic preservation cases we find. So for example, the Hawthorne Farm, we decided it could not be saved because it wasn't affordable and it wasn't a historic preservation priority. So I guess priority is one of the key words there. You know, given the, in a time of fiscal constraint in a free market system that privileges capital and private property ownership, we're gonna have limited tools. And so this is one of the things gonna come up. And of course, one of the dangers is that property owners could in effect blackmail the town by threatening development under destruction in places and trying to force us to expend money, which obviously we can't do. Uh, just to follow Mr. Hayden's point about the general issue, as some will recall, one of the forces that helped us move the master plan toward completion was the sun setting on our phase growth bylaw, which was ruled unconstitutional, along with others in the state. And we had in place replacement for that, the de development modification bylaw, which would have done some of the things that we all support, like encouraging good growth and discouraging bad growth, and town meeting in its wisdom decided collectively not to support that. Uh, but we have tools that we could be thinking about in the future, and I hope we will again. Yeah. Other comments? Mr. Croner. Yeah, I just want to add one more tool to, to Mr. Walt's list, and that's transfer development rights. I think this would be a, a good candidate for transfer development rights. Thank you. Okay, um, I think that concludes then our discussion of the zoning article of the uh, chapter 61 right of first refusal, but we need a motion, I think. Ms. I Brewer. could do that. Yes. I move that in accordance with MGL chapter 61, section eight, to not exercise the town's right of first refusal to purchase lot four as described on a plan of land entitled Plan of Land, located in Amherst, Massachusetts, Flat Hills Road, prepared for W.D. Coles, Inc., dated January 20th, 2012, land currently classified and taxed as forest land, being sold and or converted to some other use. Second. All in favor, uh, Mr. Hayden, you would Just like a to comment, speak. which is yes. gonna have a question mark in it. Sure. We get some back taxes on this, right? Yeah. About 500 and some odd dollars. Is that all yes, okay. and there's a, there's a uh, certificate from the assessors in your packet that oh, okay. details yeah. that. Yeah. Okay. All in favor, say aye. 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 Okay, so now we're ready to move on to the budget policy and guidelines discussion. And Ms. O'Keefe um, had modified our guidelines yes and um i do not know whether i should read the new additions or the whole of the guidelines it seems like a lot to read so maybe i should just read the new additions mr Hayden. i was going to recommend that you read the edition since we have read the rest of it in, yes in earlier okay. weeks yeah. all right and it is so, available online too for people and it to is realize. right so we are talking about FY14 revenue, and um, I will read the sentence, uh, sentences. 
We support maintaining a level services budget to the degree that it is possible while recognizing the necessity of addressing the loss of community development block grant funds. It is critical to find a way to continue funding the winter emergency shelter and other human service agency investments as well as town staff support for these efforts. This may well be the greatest challenge of the FY14 budget and we are confident in your ability, because this is stressed to Mr. Musanti, to find a thoughtful and practical solution. And then under expense reduction, um, I will read what was modified, the whole sentence. The select board continues to support appropriate regionalization and reorganization where such initiatives would reduce costs and realize efficiencies. And we would like to see real progress on the emergency dispatch regionalization effort in particular. And later on in that same paragraph, there is a paragraph uh, sentence added saying, we encourage the town's continued success at expense reduction via quote, ordinary end quote means such as aggressive cost comparison, reducing waste and seeking greater efficiency. And, um, do we have an update under economic development about our current commercial sector as a percent? Uh, it, it's not ready current? for tonight. Okay. And then other new revenue has these new portions. We believe the renewal of the strategic partnership agreement with UMass provides an important opportunity to ensure that all relevant categories of costs incurred by the town are included and updated. We encourage active pursuit of similar reimbursements with Amherst College and Hampshire College. Um, a sentence further on, we appreciate and encourage the town's aggressive pursuit of grants to offset costs and expand services. And again, another sentence further on, we support strong local advocacy for the statewide effort to increase funding for road work and other transportation and transit transit infrastructure and the last one includes amongst the possible grants for additional capital the park grant program which has been good for us in the past and hopefully will be in the future so those are the amendments to the um, guidelines for the budget guidelines for fy14 and um, I would ask the board uh, to, for comments, suggestions for additions or corrections. Mr. Hayden. First of all, I want to thank Stephanie for um, doing a very good job of, of distilling our conversation, as I recall it, um, when, about these things. I want to point out, I, I support these, I'm very happy with these, but I want to point out that um, by adding them, or adding several of them, uh, we are going to have to revisit this next year because these are things in here are very timely and specific to this fiscal year and may not be um, appropriate in other fiscal years. So just, just um, I don't mind taking on the extra work, but I just want to remind my colleagues that it's going to be there. Right. That's why we do this every year, I guess. Even if it's. Well, we were getting like, close to a sort of a. Yeah. a it seems like deja philosophy. vu all over again, but it really isn't. Yeah. Other comments from the select board? Okay, so we could take public comment at this time on the budget guidelines. Would someone uh, waving? Thank you. My name is Waylene Greeny, and I'm a town meeting member from Precinct 10. Um, I really appreciate the comment that uh, our town manager uh, spoke last uh, select board meeting about the CDBG money. Um, you recognize that the CDBG money is critically important to help serve some of town's neediest residents. And uh, with that said, um, I understand further that um, you are discussing a revised um, budget guidelines here. So while you are trying to deliberate the fine points, 
I think in terms of the uh, process and procedure, um, thinking about in the past when I uh, apply for uh, town social service funding, these are the steps that um, agencies have to go through. So while you're trying to decide whether you want to increase the budget by including, uh, by restoring the human service budget line item, I'd like to point it out. Just in case if you do decide to do that while you deliberate, there are a couple things I would think it's wise for you to put in place. And the first thing is that the current CDBG advisory committee, unfortunately, because of the transfer out of the um, line item, was eliminated, so therefore the Community Development Committee, CDC, has been changed, completely eliminated the responsibility of overseeing the uh, human service budget, uh, the human service funding. So therefore that committee, CDBG Advisory Committee, might have to transform itself to become a committee that uh, will address this uh, application process uh, that you, you know, if you choose to, that will have to happen. So that's one thing about having a committee will uh, help the town to uh, evaluate appropriate applicants. That's one thing. And that will take time to do. And the second thing is the agencies, they need to be notified, saying that the town might be considering adding, restoring this human service line item back, so therefore the notification needs to go out to give you know, agencies time to respond um, to this possibility of funding. So therefore, the, that also takes time. And then you will have to set a deadline. In the past, I remember February 1st was the deadline for all human service funding, uh, for all human services to submit their uh, proposals to the town. And then I know that you will have, uh, while well, you are accepting the uh, applications, the same time the four towns meeting is taking place, that you are discussing the budget um, for Amherst, and the town manager will provide the budget proposal for FY14 on January 16, 2014. So all these things will unfold. So it all takes time. So I'm just you know hopeful that the line item will be restored. But in the meantime, while you deliberate to see that will be the case, I would say it's really a good idea for you to really ha help the human service agencies to put all the steps that are necessary in place. This way, you will not be scrambling. For example, if you decide to put that human service funding in place, say in January, when town manager come up with the budget proposal, by then, January 16th was really too hard for human service funding agencies to come give you the proposal while you take a position for the May town meeting. So that's the kind of logistics issues I like to ask you to uh, consider as well while you have so much on your plate already. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Um, Ms. Brewer. I want to make sure that we're very clear at this point in the process that while all those steps are important to be aware of and to consider if we were to go down the road of returning a human services line item to the budget, these budget guidelines do not say to go back to what we used to do. They do not even begin to say that. So we should not make the assumption that by including this as a priority that we are going to go back to a way that we've previously done things. So I appreciate the understanding of just like the process that is currently in place for community development block grant funding has certain proposal dates, certain deadline dates, and that we would need to either have that committee do something slightly different or an additional process if we were to do it that way. There, this, I can't say it any clearer. This does not say restore the human services line item to the budget. That is not what this says to do. This asks the town manager to consider what might be done by the time he's ready to put out his budget, by which time we might know something different about the community development block grant status. But it in no way says that we will go back to doing things the way they were being done before. Okay, other comments from Mr. Weiss.
Jerry Weiss, Precinct 8, former select board member. Um, I, I'm very pleased to hear um, Ms. O'Keefe uh, speak of <coughs> the need to address this. I, I also heard that she didn't say it's going to be restored. I heard her say, please address it. So I'm going to echo her words and say, please address it. <laughs> um, uh, every agency that receives money um, needs that every dollar. And, and she uh, seemed to underline the emergency shelter, which um, at the moment wouldn't be able to run without that money. Um, the board actually, I'm, I, I should disclose that I am a board member of uh, Craig's Doors, which runs the emergency shelter. And um, currently, a uh, good portion of our operating funds come from the town. Um, we actually met tonight to begin discussing this pot potential crisis. Um, we didn't come up with any answers <laughs> either, but um, we need to be ready to get in gear if we have to. Um, so you all know the stakes. I don't, I don't have to remind you of that. Um, I just appreciate that you're, you're speaking of it and just want to put my two cents in that it's really, that's really vital that some way be found to replace that money. I also want to say that while I was on the board, I went along with a plan to replace um, human service funding with CDBG funding um, against a lot of, uh, there, were, there was quite a, a, a segment of the population of town meeting that was against that replacement, feeling like A, it's soft money, it can disappear, and then what's going to happen? We might be there in a year. And B, town should always be supporting with tax money extra social service funding. But I went along with the plan, so I just want to say, for my promise was, as long as the CDBG money was there, I went along with it. Um, if it's not going to be there, alternate fun ways of funding it should be found. Where I was to be on the board, I would be more adamant because that was my promise. <laughs> I remember. <laughs> <laughs> I took a lot of flack for that, so. I remember. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you. I uh, appreciate your deliberation on this. You're welcome. Others, um, Mr. Oldham. Still getting flack. <laughs> <laughs> Jim Oldham, Precinct 5. Um, town meeting <coughs> member. Uh, so I want to echo the appreciation for the new language is currently in the guidelines and I recognize that we, we're still in an uncertain period. We might actually get the block grant money though this is through the appeal process or more likely some kind of transitional funding. But what I really would like to see, I would like to see the guidelines go a little bit farther. I think that um, it really is the responsibility of the select board as the elected representatives to provide guideline, guidelines in terms of priorities, budget priorities. And I think there's a very simple guideline that, that should be that human services should just because they were funded out of this one pool of money of, of block grant money as opposed to out of the general budget should not be any more heavily impacted than anything else in the budget. So if we're $900,000 short, some of that money, block grant money was directed for capital issue and should be dealt with within our cap total capital budget and use the same process for, her, for, for developing a hierarchy. I'm not interested so much in speaking to that. But as far as the, the money on the human services side, it seems to me that if we can't get it out of the block grant money, we just say put it into the pool with everything else. And if everything has to lose a half a percent across the board, let human services lose that half percent too. But it would be very, very wrong for us to say, well, human services, we pushed over here because we had the money, and now we don't have the money and it's gone. Or, or even to say, well, we can fund 50% of what we used to fund, but 
but to maintain the 3% increase that we want for, for all our other budget items, we're going to let human services, which serve the most needy members of our community, we're going to let it take a 50% hit or a 25% hit. And that would be wrong. And I think it's up to the select board to provide an instruction, a request to the town manager to bring forward a budget with that kind of equity across the budget line, uh, not because we don't trust him to do it from his own knowledge and his own capabilities and so on, but because it's your responsibility as elected members of our community to represent that, represent us to the manager who, who, who then can, can act knowing that he's acting on behalf of the, the, the voice of the community. So again, thank you for what you've put into the guidelines so far. I would encourage you to go farther and make it stronger and more precise. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Noonan. Uh, Kevin Noonan, Precinct 5. I I'll be real brief since my predecessors all articulated it very well. We appreciate very much the chairwoman's uh, recommendations. And if there's any way we can be helpful to the town manager in terms of this transitional funding, if it's at all possible, we stand ready to do that in whatever way we can. And we really appreciate that you recognize the need for human services in our community because obviously that's uh, one of the ways in which uh, we all want to be uh, to, to think of ourselves as ones that uh, people in the community that care about those who are less fortunate. So thank you again. I just want to make clear that it was Miss O'Keefe who revised the language, well, even though I'm, s yeah, yeah, okay. Sorry, I just want to make it clear. I, 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 I'm, I'm totally Every behind chair. it, don't get me wrong, <laughs> but it wasn't me who, who actually put the red ink in. Ms. Well, and the red ink was not much as I adore Ms. O'Keefe and all the work she does for us, this was not her idea. This was not Ms. O'Keefe's idea to do this, and if she hadn't done it, it wouldn't have happened. This was our discussion, as Mr. Hayden pointed out, right. and we were debating over where to put the block grant in this, and we put it in there, and she beautifully captured what we were looking for. Completely. But, um, at the time, yes, right. exactly. So she wrote so, the words, it was our spirit and our discussion that's reflected in the changes. That is correct. Other comments? Okay, uh, one more. Go ahead, I'm sorry, I don't know you by name. So do come up and introduce yourself. Hello, my, can you hear? Yeah, my name is Maria Giorgio Coppola, resident of Amherst, um, been here for 1980. Uh, I came from a very needy community, which is still needy, I'm from Haverhill, my father's from Lowell. And one of the things I really liked about this community is the way things were taken care of in a really good way because, you know, often those communities, people did take care of it, they didn't have that kind of money. And we've been, my husband and I were members of the business community here for many years, uh, paid numerous fees, maybe they're not called taxes per se, for many, many years, a house in Belchtown, the eastern part of the state, and, you know, with no children. And one of the things when people say, you know, you're not getting things, I was like, I said, well, people are getting things. So, I mean, we've never resented. I've never resented the money in Haverhill. I've never, we've never resented anything. But, you know, if, but because it was going to the right place, everything's the right, but in terms of these services were cut, and I think there's many other people in these kind of positions or are retired or that kind of thing, and, uh, you know, it, you begin to wonder, you know, is your money really going? Where is the most need and the biggest priority? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, if there are no other comments, then I think we will move on. Um, okay, Liz, Liz Stein. Yes, Ms. Brewer. So I would say based on the timeline that Ms. O'Keefe provided us at the top of the page, which we forgot to change to FY14, um, <laughs> that <clears throat> because as Mr. Hayden pointed out, we had the pool in here last year, we didn't put the pool in here this year, et cetera. That doesn't mean anything was a problem with the pool. Don't scare anybody. Um, we just didn't need to call it out specifically this year. So she's going to faint when we tell her that we're not actually going to change any of this wording, and we're going to look at it again on the 5th. And the only change we're making is we're capitalizing the G in block grant funds and putting the CDBG abbreviation or acronym next to it. We're not changing anything else as I understand it. 
I have no suggestions to make for changes. Yours are fine. I'm sure Excellent. Mr. Musanti will be happy to make those. <laughs> sure, he says, uh-huh, yeah. whatever. Yep. I just did. <laughs> All right. There you go, see? So we're All good right. for November. So blue ink. It, All right. it, in the interest of efficiency, I think we will move on to the town manager's report. And we're only 10 minutes behind time. And I know that many people would like to go to the presidential, hear the presidential debate or see it on TV. Yes, we can't get to Florida between <laughs> now and nine. No. <laughs> uh, yes, the, the uh, uh, first item on my town manager's report <coughs> relates to uh, draft uh, updates to our taxi regulations, which has been a process underway really in earnest for most of this calendar year. Uh, at the time, taxi licenses were renewed for the calendar two tw 2012, uh, and we had some discussion after Springtown meeting of where we stood uh, in our planning for 2013. Uh, it was really clearly communicated by myself and by the select board that uh, there would be a, a process that would occur uh, between uh, the summer and uh, up until now uh, to uh, compose uh, proposed updates to taxi regulations and um, um, adopt them. Uh, and our timeline is such that tonight you're receiving a draft uh, with the recommendation that you take a position on these at your November 5th meeting so that they can be in place for the license renewal process that would occur the final two months of the calendar year. Um, so you have the draft regulations uh, in your packet. Uh, um, there are uh, a lot of housekeeping and clarification uh, statements added that put into writing some of our current process. But uh, for purposes of a summary, uh, there are um, really uh, three main uh, areas. Uh, um, the uh, uh, four, ma four main things. Uh, in section two, licenses and permits required. There's a lot of new language in there, but it's making clear what the existing process is. For example, if you operate a taxi business with a business location in the town of Amherst, it makes clear references to land use and other permits that are required. So that when an, when an applicant picks up the regulations or a permit, uh, it's clear that that's not the only thing that the applicant needs to do to operate a business with, an, with a business location in Amherst. So there's a number of references there that involve our, our land use and, and uh, building uh, zoning uh, processes with uh, planning and building staff and the appropriate uh, permit boards. Um, so that's section two. Uh, section uh, um, um, actually there's also at the very end of section two, uh, um, there is new language proposed uh, uh, that gives the select board discretion without setting a hard and fast number of the number of such taxi businesses or taxi driver license licenses that you may wish to uh, grant in a given year. Um, we've seen a uh, substantial increase in the number of those in the last couple of years especially. Uh, recommendation from staff is that it be made clear in the regulations uh, an authority you do have under current state law but is not express, expressly made in the regulations themselves that you have the authority to uh, limit the number in your discretion. Uh, so that's wanted to highlight that. Uh, section four uh, related to uh, uh, consumer protection objectives, all the kind of the basic uh, protecting those who, who use taxi services and who pay, pay for those services. Uh, replacing the current zone system with rates based on the distance traveled to a, uh, uh, a metered system uh, that you see in a number of 
communities, particularly larger communities, um, that has a, a uh, uh, determined rate per distance uh, that would be set by the uh, taxi company, taxi operator. We don't set a hard and fast uh, across the board rate, uh, but that it be uh, 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 visible to the customer what the rate is for the fare uh, as it's accumulated and what the rate per unit is uh, and that that be used. Um, so that's made clear and there's, there's uh, equipment needed uh, to implement that uh, purchase of, uh, of fare meters. Uh, next, uh, there is just wording added into the regulations that spell out our existing vehicle inspection process. What are the requirements uh, for safety of the vehicles, protocols of the drivers, um, those kinds of things. And it's just laid out, uh, I think, pretty clearly. Uh, it's a combination of the police and, and the um, uh, um, zoning enforcement staff who get involved with the inspection, so that's spelled out. And then in uh, section, uh, section six, the violations section, it spells out uh, in, uh, penalties for failing to comply. Uh, and also, and this was, I remember, a select board suggestion uh, at, at, in late spring when we talked about this process, uh, building into the regulations uh, um, an appeal process for uh, license holders who may be suspended or you're considering revoking, that there's an explicitly laid out public hearing uh, process with due appropriate notifications uh, to those and that the select board would act in that capacity in your role as the licensing board uh, for the town. So that was a uh, suggestion I believe that came from the uh, at least one board member at the beginning of this uh, uh, process. Uh, we, uh, in terms of the timeline, these are draft. Uh, we mailed the uh, draft regulations to all current um, taxi license holders uh, in the town of uh, doing business in the town of uh, Amherst. Uh, we scheduled two uh, informational meetings for feedback and questions uh, with taxi owners. Uh, we had our first such meeting with a number of staff present, including myself. Uh, we had a very good turnout of taxi owners at that meeting. There's a second meeting scheduled for later this week. I will get to you a, a uh, 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 hard co a electronic copy of the uh, 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 we received one letter and there's other additional comments that were made at the meeting. Uh, we will have that for you uh, in plenty of time for your, ne for your next meeting. So with that, I'll stop. Okay, are there questions uh, or comments on the regulations which were in our packet? I just might say for the viewers, um, I was surprised that we have actually had taxi regulations since 1992, and these are amendments um, and improvements that are being made, and actually nothing has been done with them for, what, eight years, so it's really timely. Yeah. Mr. Hayden. I just wanted to recall that when we first began considering this, is it almost two years ago now, a year and a half ago, right. um, that the the early response from the, um, the taxi company owners was positive. That, um, in fact, that they, they prefer to know <laughs> where the guidelines are than to try to fool around with them. So I'm, I'm, I'm glad to hear that there was a large turnout at the, uh, at the meeting, and I'm really interested in seeing the letter. Okay. Yep. Okay. <clears throat> Any other comments, Ms. Brewer? Okay, I try and talk fast. So associated with the, um, at the end, as you can see if you look at this online, 
as Ms. Stein mentioned, that these were originally approved in 92 and 94. <coughs> Having been on the select board since 2007, I can guarantee you no select board member I served with during since then has ever seen these before. So I'm very pleased <laughs> that the town manager's office and staff was able to find these regulations because we never knew they existed. For example, a particularly helpful item in here under section three is it talks about the phone number for complaints because I had asked about that six years ago and was told, I don't know. Um, so yeah, and that was before this town, like board, this town manager and this town manager staff. So thank you very much for that. That's incredibly helpful. Um, in an ideal world, I suppose, we might have followed the planning board's um, structure of italics, bold, strike throughs for what's new and what's old. But as we dig up these old policies, uh, that might be helpful to know what we've added in specifically, although you obviously went over a great deal of that. One thing that I remember coming up two years ago now from other taxi owners that were unhappy with some of their competition because they felt they were being unfairly competed with is there was this concept that I have not had a chance to look into further, but I wonder if it has come up, which is the idea of a livery plate or a livery license, whereas there was this idea that some people were kind of doing the livery like you think of, like you call ahead of time and you say that at 6 o'clock on such and such date you'll be picked up at the airport versus a cab, which you might hail anywhere downtown or call right from downtown and one shows up in a minute, and that there was some concern that this livery plate is a cheaper way of doing things. I just don't see it addressed in here, and I don't know if it's something we do have any control over or where that fits in. Um, the livery plate question has come up before <coughs> and from uh, some uh, taxi operators. Uh, from the operator standpoint, the primary benefit, as I understand it, is uh, cheaper insurance because the use is different. Um, livery service is basically a pre-scheduled delivery service. If you, the most common liv such livery service uh, in our area that town residents might be f familiar with is Valley Transport. Transport. Right. which is not a taxi business, it's, <clears throat> but it's a different model where you, 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 you make a scheduled uh, pickup and delivery to a destination uh, uh, well in advance. That's different from a uh, fare, you know, for hire uh, service, which is what under state law a taxi business is, and as such, different insurance requirements kick in. Uh, that, so that question has come up, um, but you know, um, that's not what the use is. So there's there's liability and other other issues uh, that are exposed with that. So there's no recommendation to. Uh, we can't really deviate from the the state regulations on that. So I'm confused. So is it worth mentioning in here that that under state law livery plates aren't permissible because I can see someone meeting all the other requirements and putting in their meter, et cetera, but if we don't have a thing that says, you you know, legally you're really not supposed to have livery plates, you're supposed to have something else, um, <clears throat> I, I'm just confused as to why we wouldn't include it if there is. If, the, if, if it's clear in state law that there is a difference between the two different types, just like we say, you know, we have land use rules about things. So the suggestion you're saying, as I, as I understand it, is we should consider adding a sentence or two in the appropriate spot that references the appropriate laws as they relate yes. to livery versus taxi licenses, t lax taxi uh, license, license plate requirements? That would be my intent, simply okay. from this. I mean, I would think that the insurance company or whoever would sort it out normally, but apparently not in the past from the comments we've gotten. So just that way we can say it wasn't our decision whether or not to let you have this livery plate. It's a state law. And if I'm inspecting your taxi right now, I'm going to say no if I see a livery plate on it because state law says you can't do that. But just so that they know because we've had some oddities, as I understand it. And then I just had a couple other quick questions that weren't nearly as complicated. Um, on page three, in the second paragraph, this is going to sound stupid, but I guess I haven't lived in a city. Uh, drivers have to wear long pants, pants or shorts. They can't wear skirts. <laughs> I'm sorry. Funny you should ask. We're so open here that, you know, it seemed. 
Odd. Um, that was one of the sections uh, we received feedback on from uh, taxi owner, and uh, we are going to uh, revise that. Um, it was never our intention for the regulations to be uh, gender right. in insensitive. So, um, so we'll, we'll give you some suggested, more appropriate, we hope, language. I was going to yeah. make a crack about adopt adopting the high school's uh, recommendations on length of skirt. But if you're driving a car, you probably have a pretty good idea of what you want that to be anyway. Uh, halfway down that page, page three, it's talking about not eating, drinking, carrying a lighted cigar, cigarette pipe, or other smoking object or device as opposed to device, I believe, unless that's some legal oh, term yeah. I'm unaware of. I'm sorry, where is that? <laughs> it's here. About halfway it's down. C. Just a typo. It's a typo. We like easy typos. Page three. Hmm. It's a typo that spell check won't pick up. It's device. Exactly, because it's a real word. Right. Yeah. And then my last one was at the bottom of page three, the second last phrase, which is very fascinating to me, this idea of a 25% discount oh, for all that. persons over the age of 65, <laughs> which I'd one, like to hear the history of, and two, I think we need to specify that they have to provide ID or they can't just tell the driver, I'm over 65, where's my discount? That seems kind of rude to the driver. If we're going to provide that to people, they should have to provide some kind of proof. I it's very think. nice. <laughs> Um, that is new language in there. Uh, um, you know, we we will we will look at language and and it's, um, be, but being careful, I think, not to get too f deep into the weeds on the how. Mm -hmm. But that here's the standard uh, that we want complied with, um, and quite frankly, it's a you know it's a minimum discount. There's nothing to prevent a greater discount. Uh, we did have some feedback about the size of the discount and whether that should be established at it, that minimum or some lesser amount as a minimum discount. I'm just thinking of potential complaints from customers saying I didn't get my discount and it's because yep. one taxi cab company requires ID and another one doesn't. You know, just because we have a bunch. Sounds good. I'm just thinking in terms of preventing people being upset about stuff although I appreciate the not getting into the weeds concept okay. mr. Hayden <clears throat> in Bermuda it was front page news when the taxi cab drivers requested permission to wear light colored socks as opposed to the black uh, knee-high socks that they are required to wear but that's not my question um, <laughs> I just wanted to point out that um, while these have been around for 10 years um, the reason that this sort of came onto our, uh, we began to pay attention to it a year or two ago, is that there's been a, a, a really a proliferation of these companies. There's been many, many more requests that we've been handling here, and um, this effort is a response to that. I mean, back in 1992, what, were there three companies maybe? Uh, with six cars? I, I don't know. If that. But now there are, geez, I've lost track of it. Many, <laughs> many. many um, some with very similar names and, and, and issues like that are beginning to come up more frequently. Okay, I'd like to move on to your second item, John, okay. which is the signage, directional signage for downtown. Okay, downtown directional signage plan, uh, brief update. Uh, uh, some time ago now, uh, funds were allocated uh, uh, through CPA and I believe a small amount of capital for wayfinding signs in our downtown. Uh, there's been uh, a renewed focus on that effort uh, over the past few months that has involved uh, a number of town staff, uh, DPW and planning staff, uh, as well as uh, feedback from uh, and represent representation from the uh, uh, business community, including the Business Improvement District. Um, basically, in, in, in the uh, select board packet, um, I've summarized where we are. Um, the focus in the near term is to identify and implement in the n very near term, meaning uh, in the matter of weeks, not, not many months, uh, the first batch of wayfinding signs, and we focused on 
directional signage to public parking uh, locations. And so uh, in the packet uh, is a, a detailed list of, of uh, proposed sites, a uh, combination of either the blue banners with the international parking symbol on it, uh, uh, in gr providing greater clarity for, you know, uh, how to get to uh, Boltwood Garage, uh, the town CBS lot, the town hall parking lot, which has no sign at all uh, presently, um, and a number of other locations. So that's the near term. Uh, and then phase two is going to be a more detailed discussion about wayfinding signs to uh, institutional and other cultural attractions in, in, in the downtown area, uh, especially in that. There'll be more to come on that, but the parking is kind of phase one. Comments, uh, Mr. There's um, um, been rumbling for, for a while now about uh, uh, regarding the, the, the signs for institutions, spine institutions. I'm wondering if this is coming out of that. There was a working group, which was part of the Chamber of Commerce, mm -hmm. the Amherst Area Chamber of Commerce, that came up with a, with a scheme. Uh, I'm wondering if this is an extension of that at all, because I've lost touch with that effort. Uh, it is an extension of that, and it's it's uh, some of the same players, but it's getting to the implementation phase and not the talk about it for a very long time phase, is, continuing for is, a very uh, long time. Is it an <laughs> item for the BID? They have representation in this group, and they've been uh, appropriately uh, well-spoken. Okay, and then that's Ms. Brewer. Sorry, if Mr. Wald wanted to go, that's fine. Mm -mm. Just want to make sure you <laughs> saw me waving my hand over here. Um, Mr. Moderator. I, I'm really not just picking on the garage, but I am a little bit. Yes. Because I would think that if you live in town, you know where the garage is. And if you don't, you're going to look for an above ground structure. I find it very frustrating that we put on directional signs that a garage is in such and such place when in fact there's the parking that's there between Rayos and the Bang Center, which is just parking, and then there's what looks like just more parking. Oh, and there's an underground space. So I don't know. I, I'm not going to fight about it, but I think it's worth considering, of course, if we change it here, we would want to change it on the cool maps that Mike Olkin makes for us too about where to park. But I'm just not really sure what I see the point of is calling it a garage to go look for as opposed to it just being parking. It's parking, who cares? I mean, the reality is there are, what, 12 spaces there between Rayos and the Bolt and um, the Bang Center that aren't part of the garage, but they're important parking spaces, especially once we use the ones behind the Unitarian Church. So I'm kind of a fan of just calling it parking, but okay. you know. Right, the garage is underground. But yeah, exactly. <laughs> not helpful when you're on Main Street looking for a building. <laughs> exactly. I get well, it. I wonder I get what, what that saying. is. <laughs> right. Other comments Thanks. or questions for Mr. Zanti? Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Um, do you have recent and upcoming activities? Uh, I do have one item uh, that I want to make you aware of, and this is in the uh, upcoming activity in the very near term, meaning uh, in a matter of uh, days and weeks. Uh, as part of ongoing regionalization uh, efforts, uh, we renewed in recent uh, couple of months uh, discussions with our neighbors in the town of Pelham related to the town of Amherst providing uh, assessing property assessment services for a fee. And there's mutual interest. Um, we have uh, a draft uh, intermunicipal agreement that spells those out. Uh, that's essentially um, sharing our, our database for property. You know, we have online access to property cards and things like that presently. Um, and a uh, very talented uh, principal assessor, assessor, Mr. Burgess, making that, extending that database in a way that allows the Pelham property uh, information to be loaded onto it. Uh, we would provide uh, um, you'd have, you know, 24-7 online access, uh, always a phone call away, but some limited uh, uh, office hour availability. 
uh, for Pelham um, in exchange for a, uh, a fee uh, that we think is quite reasonable uh, um, that we would want to do. Uh, related to this, but independent of it, uh, because there's an openness on a fee-for-service basis uh, between the two towns, uh, we are also about to apply for a uh, Community Innovation Challenge grant um, related to this service for the relatively uh, uh, low-cost uh, uh, technical enhancements that are necessary and some other things uh, to fully implement this. But this has great promise. Uh, there's there's a, a support uh, among our own staff and, and finance director, Sandy Pooler, and there's enthusiasm uh, in the town of Pelham. So there'll be more to come when it's all all put to bed, but um, I think it's a very positive, uh, positive development. And that's all I have. Okay. All right, so uh, we are on to member reports. Um, I did not, uh, I am not on BCG, but we have a uh, printed summary um, of the points that uh, the group wanted brought to the home boards. I wonder if Alyssa, Miss Brewer rather, would. <laughs> <laughs> Told you you could just say her. Oh, whatever. <laughs> yes, would like to bring out the just salient features, anything? The most salient feature beyond the reminder of Saturday, November 3rd, is where you're all going to be joining me for a meeting, I'm sure, is we aren't planning to really meet again until January 24th in case, unless something comes up, which is why we set the December 13th meeting. So um, just like you know, JCPC has to meet a million times and then doesn't meet for a long time, we're gonna luckily take a little time off and uh, be all set. The other thing is, is that under item two, we wanted to make a point of everyone noticing. I know that we all read these very carefully, but <clears throat> there have been some other boards that are associated with the BCG that in the past had not realized that they needed to read these things carefully. You will notice there's a typo there that it's obviously uh, 853 comma 000, not 853 period. But what we were trying to do was show the context in terms of dollars. I mean, we know very clearly here at this board about community development block grant monies. So the schools are a little bit aware of that because of the relationships they have with the social service agencies. But you know, that CDBG is like a select board thing, but there are also the Title I and IDA grants that are also at risk right now. And so there's just a lot that's up in the air. And so we wanted to make it clear that we were not just saying, ooh, everybody get together and support block grant, you know compensation also be aware that the schools may be running into a really big problem too and luckily the library is not so <laughs> we were very pleased to report that that none of their grants seem to be at risk right now so they seem to be in okay shape okay so I guess we can move on to liaison and representative reports I have just two minor things I guess one is that John Alyssa Stephanie and I attended the Tuesday October 16th um, open community forum uh, which was held at the UMass police station and which I thought was quite successful and thoughtful um, a dean of students I'm gonna mess up her name but it's something like Nku Galai um, and members of the community um, discussed the student code of conduct. Um, Police Chief Horvath was there. It was a thoughtful discussion. It was well attended, and people of goodwill uh, really were trying to find solutions, I thought, to common problems, and I don't know if any of the others who were there want to comment. Uh, I have one other liaison report, and that is the personnel board voted to allow the library to reorganize the staff to reflect more accurately what they actually do and in the process um, some people were able to move up steps to, um, to have equity across the different levels of the library staff and that's my stuff as who anybody else want to okay 
Housing and Sheltering Committee um, has a meeting this week to review a draft of the housing production plan that's already been provided to them. And then the, pu the public forum is on November 1st. So a reminder of that, that's at Ann Whalen on the fifth floor on Thursday, November 1st, which is also the date, although not the time, luckily not a conflict, with the first annual meeting of the Amherst Business Improvement District, which is actually being held in the morning on Thursday, November 1st. And the only other comment I would have is that obviously as the block grant process, um, as we find out more or don't, um, we will need to be feeding back into what the usual schedule is of the block grant process and so that the people serving on the committee know what's going to happen as well as all the people who applied for money know what's going to happen. But when we don't know an answer, we can't really tell them either. Okay, calendar preview. Um, Thursday, right? 10:25. Is that Thursday? That's the time. Yes. Yep. The trivia bee will be held supporting the Amherst Educational Foundation at 7 o'clock at the Amherst Regional Middle School Auditorium. And Mr. Musanti has agreed to be our fourth member. Um, so it should be interesting. No wigs. <laughs> no wigs. <laughs> no wigs. Not this year. On uh, November 3rd is the Fort Towns meeting, which I think Alyssa was alluding to, from 9 to 11.30 at the Amherst Regional Middle School Library. There's a select board meeting on the 5th of November, uh, where we will continue discussing the budget policy guidelines and take positions on town meeting warrant articles. And the warrant review is November 8th from 7 to 9 30 in this very room, the town room. And that's all that I know of. So um, if, unless somebody has something they would like to say, we do have to sign the warrant and we do have to sign um, the, a notice of intent on the um, Coles property. And the Is, order of layout. Pardon? And the order of layout, Olympia. And the order of layout also. For Olympia yep. Drive, right. Mr. Hayden. I would move to adjourn to a suitable place to watch the uh, debate. <laughs> and, but first sign the documents. Okay. And so it's about what? Second. 9-11. All in favor say aye. Aye. So November 8th is the warrant review. How did I not know that?